Adoption of the minutes for December 17th meeting. Call the motion. Second. Please vote. Okay. I would like to thank the staff and communications for taking the meeting tonight and for posting on the district website. Thank you. We will now go into a spe uh, special recognition beyond the class. Judy now. Thank you, President Mara. Uh, at this time in our agenda, uh, we recognize an outstanding employee who goes above and beyond the classroom. They are nominated by a fellow staff member. And uh, our recipient for this evening comes to us from Shava, Shava's Academy. And at this time, I would like uh, Brenda Schachtel, fifth grade teacher, to come to the podium at this time, along with her principal, Dr. Stuart Payne. Brenda, we, we thank you for coming this evening. Um, you were actually nominated by a fellow colleague, a, a fellow fifth grade teacher that had nominated you and had wonderful things to say about you, um, stating that you definitely go above and beyond the classroom. Um, you have to wear many hats, fifth grade team lead. Um, you participate in extracurricular activities. Uh, uh, Brenda coaches girls and boys soccer while simultaneously coaching math field day. As if that's not enough, she is the avid grade level lead as well as an invaluable member of the C Cesar Chavez Academy PBIS Tier 2 team. And we want her to know that we appreciate all the love and support she gives to our students and staff daily. She is definitely a difference maker on the Cesar Chavez campus. So we're very honored that you're here this evening and um, thank you so much for all that you do above and beyond the classroom.
presentation to the board, Mr. Alan Giles. Thank you, Madam President. Um, my pleasure tonight to have Andrew Park, familiar face to many of you, um, from Edie Bailey, may not be a familiar name, used to be called VTD, our uh, auditors. And so Andrew's here actually to present, make two presentations to you tonight. One is our the audit of our district financials, and the second presentation will be of our Measure GG uh, bond uh, financials. So Andrew Park. Thank you for being here tonight. Well, good evening and Happy New Year. Pleasure to be here again. So tonight, I'll be presenting two items. But, you know, let's talk about, let's preface this presentation in terms of what I do as auditors for you. So first off, as your auditor, we are your agents. And I, if you could look at all the correspondences, it's addressed directly to the governing board. And effectively, what this is is, you know, I would hate to analogize, but I mean, since we're in a school district, this is a report card of the district's finances. And what am I here to answer, ultimately? The question that I'm answering is, from July 1st, 2018, through June 30th, 2019, the district has, in the past, approximately in September of last year, presented what you, what you would call an unaudited actuals. These are the unaudited information as of, as of June 30th, 19, covering 18, 19 fiscal year. My primary responsibility is to audit that information and report back to the board, letting you know, are those numbers correct? Again, my primary focus is on the number. Are they correct? So without further ado, let's, let's uh, jump into the thick report. Do we all have copies of the audit report? This is the annual audit of the district in its entirety. And as you know, this document is a bit thick. Okay, and there's no expectation for each of the board members to read this inside and out. <laughs> we would appreciate it if you do, but there's no expectation. The fastest way to get an idea in terms of how the audit went is to go to page 108 of the audit report. Okay, so I'll wait until you flip there. Okay. So page 108 is what we call the summary of auditor's results. It's literally a summary of all the results that were accumulated as a result of our audit procedures. So as you, as you can see on this page, we opine on three specific areas of the district's financial statements and also compliance. So first is financial statements. Again, answering the question of, are the numbers good? So for instance, if, if the district's business services division ended the year with $100 million, I answered the question of, is it really $100 million, or is it $95 million, or is it $105 million? Okay? And even before I get into the results of this, let's kind of, I'm going to throw some technical terms out there so that I can yeah, have an understanding in terms of what I'm talking about. So we render an opinion, and it's on a varying level of assurances. Highest level of assurance is, an, is what we call an unmodified opinion. Second level of assurance is what we call a qualified opinion. And the last level of assurance is an adverse opinion. So to put this into perspective, what we are is, I'm going to use a car as a metaphor, we're the check engine light. Okay? It runs, if you don't get a check engine light as, as, as intended, but we're basically the check engine light if there is a problem. Okay? So without further ado, let's just, just go through the results here. First, again, is on the financial statements. We answer the question of whether or not the district's financial statements as of June 30th, 2019 are fairly stated in all, all material specs. Our opinion was unmodified with respect to the district's financial statements. In other words, we believe that the financial statements are materially st stated and all presented properly. Okay? Um, bulk of our work when it comes to our audit represents about 80% looking at the procedures designed to, to report financial information. So for instance, what am I trying to do here? If you process a dollar, does that dollar get reported on the financial statements as a dollar, or does it get reported as a dollar to the dollar? Okay, 80% of our work is just looking at procedures and checks and balances. Um, based on the procedures that we performed, we did not identify any deficiencies related to the procedures involved with reporting your financial information. Okay, so let's move on to federal awards. So, Years ago, the feds basically passed a regulation stating that if you receive X dollar in federal assistance annually, any recipient of these federal funds are subject to what's called a single audit pack. So what exactly is that threshold? So if you receive 750000 or more in a given year, 
you're subject to what's called a single audit act, and I'm the guy that comes in and basically audits the information and reports back to the feds. So just to give you a scale of what took place, Corona Norco spent $37 million in federal funds, okay? Um, based on the testing performed, we did not identify any deficiencies in the checks and balances to ensure compliance with these programs. And specifically, what programs did we audit? We audited your Title I Part A, which is a program intended to provide assistance to low-income students. Um, let's see, Title II Part A, which is designed to provide professional development. And then your Medicaid cluster, to provide some medical assistance to the, the needy as well. Um, to give you an idea, the programs that we tested covered 12.1 12, 12 million dollars, which is about 33% of the total federal expenditures that you've incurred. Um, based on the testing we performed for four of these sample programs, our opinion was unmodified when it comes to the district's compliance with these programs. Okay. And lastly, we perform a series of procedures prescribed by the State Controller's Office and also with the uh, California Department of Education when it comes to state compliance requirements. Now, in case you're curious, list of all the programs that were required to test is on page 105. The way state compliance works is basically uh, there's a lot of interested parties that kind of deliberate annually to kind of figure out what needs to be audited and how, sh how, sh how should it be audited. Coincidentally, um, last Monday I actually went to the uh, state controller's office and sort of deliberated in terms of what needs to be done in a, in a very specific area in terms of what we could do as auditors. So it happens annually. But as you see on this page here, you're going to see some yes notations and no notations. Yes notations mean that it is applicable to the district and we did perform procedures. No means that the district either did not administer the program or did not receive financial assistance and as a result, the district was not subject to it. Now when I say procedures, I don't come up with the procedures. The state controller's office basically tells us how to audit this, step by step, one through ten. Okay? So based on the procedures that we perform for all the applicable programs, our opinion was unmodified with respect to the district's state compliance requirements. Okay. So that pretty much sums up the results of the audit that took place for the 1819 fiscal year. Do you have any questions for me that I can try to answer? Um, just a quick question. I know you've already said it because uh, we came in at the unmodified looks like pretty much across the board but maybe a, a simpler way to ask the question or for the audience to understand what you're saying is so if this was your house meaning the district you feel pretty good about your house and your financial situation is that a fair assessment let me, let me point it this way, okay, in an academic setting. So, in academia, we have a grade scale of A through F. Hopefully that's the case. I don't know if that's the case anymore. <laughs> Instead of grading you on an A through F scale, audit is designed to say pass, pass with exception or fail, okay? In this case, we're saying you pass. Okay, so that, that's the easiest way for me to kind of stay within my professional requirement and answer the question. Qualify. Okay, very good. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. If there's no uh, further questions, let's move on to the uh, results of the Measure GG audit. That's the uh, smaller down report. Okay, so I'm going to cover this one fairly quickly. So this report is kind of segmented into two parts. First half is the financial audit, similar to what we would do for the district, but as a segmented information, meaning that our testing is a little bit more detailed and the threshold is a little bit more detailed. Just to give you an overview in terms of what took place during the 18-19 fiscal year is, the district began the year with uh, $94.2 million. Out of the $94.2 million, um, the district spent 69.4 million dollars. So the district was heavily involved in construction and capital outlay related projects, okay? Just to give an idea. And 
before I get into the actual results, our, our primary responsibility when it comes to a bond audit is to report back to you, did the district spend the funds in accordance to what the voters have requested or voted in the past under Measure DG? We answer the question of, were the funds spent in accordance to Measure DG the okay. <laughs> So, based on our testing that we covered to determine compliance of uh, how the district fund spent the funds, we tested approximately $57.8 million, okay, which represents 83% of the total expenditures incurred from July 1st, 18 through June 30th, 19. And based on the testing we performed, we did not identify any exceptions that deviated from what the district should have spent the money. Any questions on that? Okay. Now, if you have any questions, feel free to you know address the questions to your management, and then they'll relay it to me, and I could always answer them in the future. All right. Thank you. Special Education Committee Advisory. C. C. Results of GG Series C General Obligation Bond, bond Issuance and Measure U General Obligation Bond Refinances. Alan Jones. Thank you, Madam President. Again, uh, as you know, over the in the fall, the district uh, we completed several significant financial transactions. One was the issuance of eighty-six million dollars of Measure DG bond money, Series C, and the other was a refunding of some Measure U bonds of about thirty-four million dollars. A refunding of bonds is just like a refinancing of your home. Uh, when the market's good, we have an opportunity to refund it and save. Uh, interest and so that's what we did so we have with us here tonight Tim Carty um, I'm gonna say from Piper Jaffrey but I know that's no longer the full name of the company because I know they've had a, a little bit of a change here lately I'll let Tim explain that and Tim will take you through a few slides showing you the results of those two major transactions that were completed in the fall of 19 thank you Tim for being here sure my pleasure thank you Alan good evening Madam President members of the board I'm Tim Carty uh, as Alan said from Piper Jaffrey you're Longtime financial advisor. We do have a little bit of news. We acquired on January 3rd a smaller financial services firm called Sandler O'Neill, and we're gradually going to be migrating to the Piper Sandler going forward. I was kidding with John. Poor Mr. Jaffrey uh, has been dead 150 years and now, unfortunately, having his name taken off the, uh, the moniker. But uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we still own the name Piper Jaffrey, but we'll gradually be calling ourselves Piper Sandler in the future. Uh, as Alan uh, described, and I know you're busy uh, agenda uh, ahead of you, so I'll, I'll go through this fairly briefly, but we had a very successful combination of two bond transactions in the fall. <clears throat> One was tapping into Measure GG for our Series C bonds. And the other was, while we were at it, as Alan described, uh, refinancing some old Measure U bonds and saving money for local taxpayers. So in the last three or four years, there's been a uh, fairly recent uh, state law that once a bond transaction for a school district is completed, we come back to the board with what's called the report of final sale, just to give you a, a few fast facts about the bond issue and the costs and what it all means. So I'll go through these slides fairly briefly, and obviously if any of you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. The first is, and when I mentioned that this was very successful, well, this is one of the reasons. This is the last 10 years of interest rates for school bonds in California. And if you look at that squiggly line in the bottom right-hand corner, you see that when we sold our bonds on October 2nd, we were doing that at a very opportune time. And what does that mean? The lower the interest rates on the bonds, the better the value for the taxpayers, and the better the value for the community. So we had the wind at our back in terms of uh, selling the bonds at a very favorable time. That's 
one of two reasons why I think this was so successful. The second reason is because, and I want to credit your staff for this, is we were able to maintain our very high credit ratings. We have what's called a double A2 credit rating from Moody's Investor Service, and we have a double A minus credit rating from Steiner and Porters. And those are both very good. Uh, we went to San Francisco. We spent a lot of time here in the district um, preparing. We had about a 50-page briefing booklet that a number of the members of your administrative team went up and did an outstanding job. We had back-to-back -back about two hours in length each presentation, one to Moody's, one to Standard & Poor's, and the results were getting our AA2 and our AA- minus credit ratings reconfirmed. And then at the bottom of the page, in the blue and the red, I just extracted a couple of the highlights from each of the Moody's and the Standard & Poor's reports. Uh, but if you look at the bottom ones, conservative fiscal practices, that was the phraseology that Moody's used, and then historically strong reserve levels, that was the phraseology Standard & Poor's used. That's a compliment to the district's fiscal management, that's the board, that's Dr. Lin and his entire team and the business office and so forth. So we received some very high marks from Moody's and Standard and & Poor's on our credit ratings. So the result of that was we tapped into Vision GG for our Series C bonds. If you look at the left-hand side of the page, we issued $86 million. And if you remember, we're targeting about a $39.50 tax rate per 100,000. Remember, $60 per election is what's allowed to a K-12 unified school district in California. So at $39.50, we're well below that. Look at item three. These were 30-year fixed rate bonds. Look at the interest rate, 3.13%. I mean, that's virtually unheard of, and that's almost Dwight Eisenhower era type of interest rates, extremely low. On well, the left-hand side of the page, that's really an item that we're required to show. That's just what's uh, the community's repayment obligation for that $86 million. But let me just draw your attention to the bottom line. The total payback, principal plus interest, about $153 million. That's about a little less than two to one, right? There's now a state standard. But for a school district to be able to issue bonds, the payback ratio, which is the principal and interest divided by the principal, has to be four to one or less. We were less than two. That's really less than a whole mortgage. So again, very fiscally responsible, very <coughs> beneficial to the community. Then as Alan mentioned, we had a companion piece, which was a refund. A refi of some measure U bonds about $25 million worth of old measure U bonds. And if you look at the very right hand column, savings to taxpayers, and if you look at the bottom line, we saved the community over $4 million. That's interest that would have left the community to out of town investors that now stays local. The other thing is we did it without extending the term. So if you'll notice, the old bonds, the second column from the left, go to 2039. The new bonds, the third column from the left, they go to 2039. So no extension of the term. It's around $200,000, two to $300,000 a year in savings, $4 million in total. And it's really, it's really the 2021-2022 tax year when the uh, taxpayers will really begin to see the, the benefits from the, from the refund. So uh, this was, again, very successful. And we had some benefits combining the two transactions, some efficiencies for your staff and for you, the board, in terms of, in a sense, doing a two for one. Um, this is interesting. Who are the purchasers of the bonds? Who are some of the financial organizations that now own Corona Norco Unified School District Measure GG Series C bond. So this is the $86 million Series C. And as you can see, Citigroup, which was the underwriter, so Citigroup bought the bonds from Corona Norco Unified and resold the bonds to the investing public. 
And you can see what we mean by investing public. There was a wide variety of investors. You see some household name firms there, Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan. So we had interest from a variety of investors from Wall Street to Main Street. And then you see everything from a $21 million purchase down to a $100,000 purchase. So widespread interest in the district's bonds. Why? Good credit ratings, very respected name in the market. Uh, on the refi, somewhat similar, smaller bond issue, fewer investors. But again, uh, Goldman Sachs Asset Management, First Republic, they were also a large purchaser of Series C. And then, uh, you know, everything from $7 million down to $155,000. So just to give you a little flavor for some of the organizations that were participants and purchased some of the district's filings. This is just a little bit of money in, money out. If you look at the green, $86 million was the amount of Series C. Now if you drop to uses of funds, five and a half the page project fund, that's what you netted for projects. But call it $85.5 million, and that's because it was about half a million dollars in transaction costs, which we'll describe in a minute. That $8.3 million, the investors who purchased the district's bonds, they paid a little more than 100 cents on the dollar for the bonds. They, in a sense, gave us $8.3 million extra. But that belongs to the taxpayers. So that's a credit against the taxpayers' first year's worth of uh, tax obligations on the bonds. So that $8 million just flows in, goes to Riverside County, and is a credit against what's owed by the community. Uh, the last two slides, just a little bit of detail about the transaction costs. I jumped ahead by one slide. So on Series C, there was about half a million dollars <coughs> worth of transaction costs. Almost always the largest component is the bond underwriter city group. And then you had a group of um, some uh, transaction costs, our firm, your legal counsel, uh, Moody's, Standard & Poor's, some miscellaneous items toward the bottom part of the page. And then similarly on the refinancing, same thing, largest component, the uh, bond underwriter city group, same line items for the most part, some miscellaneous costs at the bottom. So I think just to sum up, um, congratulations to the district, compliments to you. I think we delivered an outstanding uh, product for the community. Uh, got you some measure GG money, so you continue your projects, and at the same time took advantage of low interest rates, as you, the board, has always wanted to do, to save money for local taxpayers. And so I will stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. And again, uh, thank you for letting me be here tonight. It's just so nice to see you. Yeah, is there anything that, that you think we should add? No, unless the board has any questions. We're very pleased with both transactions, so thank you for your support. Thank you, Tim, for uh, helping us through that. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Now the Special Education Committee. Community Advisory Committee. Thank you, Madam President. So at this time, I'm going to call on Mrs. Tricia Thompson, Administrative Director, to come up here and introduce our parent group. I know they've been working hard, not only this year, but for many years. All right, good evening, Madam President, and board, executive cabinet. Um, we are here tonight because we have a fabulously dedicated group of parents that are part of our community advisory committee. They, as part of being a single district SELPA, one of their bylaws is that they come annually to present to you on things that they've worked on and things that they hope to work on in this year. So I have with me these fabulous ladies. We have Heather Snow. We have Lisa Herring, and we have Jamie Gillian, three parents, um, all have students with special needs, amazing, amazing ladies that are incredibly dedicated and passionate to what they, they do, so they have some great information to share with you tonight. Thank you, Trisha. Um, hi, good evening. Um, thank you. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Eloise, Eloise Herring, or Lisa Herring. I am the CAC... Um, Community Relations Board member. This would be Jill, Jamie Gilliam. She is our, our chair and Heather Snow, our secretary. Um, 
Okay, so the, our board members um, are comprised of, uh, we have five parent reps and three special ed reps. Um, Oh, I'm sure. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, we are a community advisory committee of the Special Education Department for Corona North Unified School District. We, the CAC, are comprised of parents with children with disabilities, as well as the director, <coughs> teachers, district employees, and community members that have a common goal to represent the 7,200 families um, of the Special Education Department to ensure our children have good practices in place to assist in their success. We are designed uh, to be a dynamic collaborative partnership of educators, parents, and community members. This mandated membership exemplifies the need for informed involvement among those who provide special education programs and services and those who receive special education programs and services. Our function is to be the heart of special education under the le sorry, legislative uh, California Ed Code Section 56194. We are to be the vehicle for active community involvement in developing and reviewing the local plan by ways of parent trainings and education by bringing positive changes in the educational system. I'm going to go ahead and give it over to Jamie. Um, in the in 2018 2019 school year, these are some of the things that we worked on. We had monthly meetings um, every month except for December and July. We held <coughs> parent trainings. Um, the first was on how to navigate the IEP process, <coughs> speech and language, and one on mental health. We held our special education art show, which is usually a hit. Um, we attended Legislation Day in Sacramento where we attended a um, conference with the SELPAs and the CACs across the state, and then we also met individually with Senator Roth and Assembly Member Cervantes. And um, we attended other events like Special Forces Games Day and other things in the community. This year, um, we're continuing to hold our monthly meetings every month except December and July. We've had two parent trainings already, one on Behavior 101 and one on Preschool, which is basically how to navigate the preschool process and the IEP process. And then in February, we'll be having Pathways Through Special Education, uh, which will be on transitions. Um, we are having a Special Education Resource Fair on May 21st. We're going to continue the connection between the district and the special education families. There's a large push for inclusion, um, and so we're really trying to fill the void on, on our board for the general education role. Uh, and then we'll be working, we have four members that will be part of the local planning committee, so we'll be working on the local plan. <laughs> The goal of the CAC is to create ongoing collaboration between families and the school district to support systemic improvements for our uniquely able community. That's all for our presentation. Um, does anyone have any questions? Well, I just have a comment. I um, appreciate what you do. I've been able to see some events. I see your daughter out there. I want to wait there. <laughs> yeah, she's out there. She's but I just really appreciate um, the support. The, the art show was just fabulous. I, I think we've all um, been there, and it's just great. And then um, the special uh, forces uh, games day. The, the game day. I, I, last year was the first year I believe for from the Norco, and I, I hope that that continues to grow. But just thank you guys for for all you do. Thank you. We thank you that for allowing us to speak tonight and presenting to you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to acknowledge all of the uh, presenters tonight. I really appreciate the um, informative um, presentations and certainly congratulations to Brenda, um, our um, teacher of Young Classroom, as well worth recognition for her, and she certainly has earned that recognition. Um, Madam President, thank you um, this evening for beginning the uh, meeting by acknowledging we see young men we lost in our community. It was a very difficult weekend. Um, for all of us as a community. And um, in fact, right before the board meeting began, I received a text from the county superintendent, Dr. Judy Lang. She certainly expresses her um, condolences and wanted to give us uh, her uh, warm wishes and prayers to all the family. 
and letting them know that the community that's supporting these families um, and our community at large extends way beyond Conorado and it's really in the hearts and minds of the entire Riverside County. We much, much appreciate that um, from Dr. Light. So I want to acknowledge her and share that with you in our community. We are also, if you pay attention to the ties and the color of dresses and uh, jackets that we're wearing today, is also for another very um, worthy cause, if you will. And we understand that we have these special days designated to support um, our family members, again, stay years to with cancers. And uh, today, uh, I should say tonight, all of us are wearing different colors to represent exactly that. Because there's so many different type of cancers that we all suffer, and I can speak with confidence that all of us at least know, uh, if not a family member, certainly friends are impacted by cancer. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the color of the rain, and therefore in supporting those who are fighting cancer that we're in this together as a community. I'd like to begin uh, to my right with Evita. Evita, you're wearing the color and the type of cancer um, that we're supporting for the uh, individual who are fighting. Sure, thank you. I'm wearing the color black um, in recognition of melanoma. And uh, I'm wearing the color green in recognition of liver cancer, uh, which has affected uh, a member of my family. So this is uh, something close to my heart. I'm also wearing black. Um, and it is also the color for Maranoma. I have a very good friend of mine, actually. Um, I go through a very early retirement because of this particular cancer. I, I'm wearing purple, and it's uh, in uh, respect for uh, pancreatic cancer. I'm wearing uh, dark blue as a uh, symbol for uh, those fighting colon cancer. I'm encouraging everybody to definitely get your colonoscopies. I'm wearing pink, um, recognizing breast cancer in honor of family members and friends who are fighting the, the cancer currently. I'm wearing dark blue suit uh, to uh, support colon cancer, uh, which uh, affected my, my father. My dad uh, was diagnosed with colon cancer and then eventually passed away. Thank you. And I'm wearing black and red, even though it has a little pink, because my mom had uh, breast cancer. Thank you, and thank you to, to the board for giving us the opportunity. And, and Bill, thank you for, for, for the suggestion uh, of really putting awareness of all different types of cancers that we all know and are facing one way or another in our lives. Um, with that said, I'd like to yield the rest of my time to a short presentation to Dr. Simon, because we indeed, uh, Dr. Simon, we have an opportunity, correct? Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lin, for uh, allowing us to take your time with your, uh, your report. Um, as you know, um, in our uh, presentations before and also um, in the board mail out, you've received information on the California School Dashboard, which as you know, um, shows performance of our district, schools, and student groups. And so this evening, um, I have a few uh, colleagues here that will come to the podium and they're just going to share some information of our findings. And what we've been doing is we've been taking each area such as grad rate, college and career indicators, and so on, and looking at it in depth. And what we focused on recently was the graduation rate. And it caught our attention. We had several meetings, and we have been studying the why and um, just kind of, you know looking at it from a broad perspective and then really funneling it down. And what we found, um, it kind of took us down a pathway that we did not expect took us down the pathway of alternative education, specifically two programs within alternative ed. And so what we want to do is share this with you. Obviously, there's no action to be taken this evening. We want to share this information with you. We do know we'll be coming back in the future to a potential board study session or, or what have you. Um, and also, we'll be getting continuing uh, information in um, board mail outs. But we just wanted to share this with you because it, it was an aha for us. We shared it with Dr. Lynn and thought that you would, you would want to hear from us. We have some talking notes, just the, just because as you're hearing it verbally, it might be nice to see it on, on, this, on um, the slide. And you also have the notes in front of you. Madam President, Board, Executive Cabinet. Um, since we're discussing alternative education programs, it would be helpful to look at uh, all our programs in context. Currently, we have nine excellent alternative education programs. 
Each one has its own nuance and registration process. Although these programs have been successful, we're working toward a future long-term solution in creating a more centralized alternative education system. This will have the effect of expanding our early intervention safety net and create a more equitable system where all truly means all. As we are in the beginning stages of that process, we believe that tonight we have a viable recommendation that we can implement at Corona Norco uh, Alternative, which you see up there, which is the uh, grades 9 through 12 independent study program at Pollard High School and also at Orange Grove High School. And so as um, Dr. Simon spoke about uh, the California dashboard, part of the area that we focused our attention on was looking at the graduation data for the district as a whole and then how that's made up. So just as a reminder, the graduation data for our district is made up of our comprehensive high schools such as Santiago Centennial and is made up of our alternative schools. And in particular, uh, we, it caught our attention in our two of our schools, which was Orange Grove, and it's coming up in orange up on the uh, slide up there, and then Corona Marco Alternative. And so it just brought our attention to ask more questions to go deeper with the data. And as we started going deeper with the data, we reflected on what are other districts doing and talking to them as well. And so as we think about that, um, we wanted to take a look at um, districts such as Escondido, Marietta, Rialto, Riverside, and so forth, and what's happening with them. And they were seeing some gains in it, and we learned some things with the networking within our community to understand those pieces. One of the components is tied to Ed Code, and Ed Code states that for our districts, LEAs have the, the latitude to be able to determine the graduation requirements. The state says you have to have a minimum of 130, but LEAs such as Crown Marco can determine what that is above and beyond the 130. So some of these districts have adjusted their alternative uh, graduation requirement um, for the alternative schools. And additionally, um, these districts have, when they've looked at that data, they've said that the graduation requirements that they're taking away or removing would be elective credits. But all of the core requirements are still part of the graduation requirement. And so as we look deeply at two of our school's programs, such as Orange Road and Alternative Ed, we wanted to go to look at that. What does that look like for us? And so I'm going to turn it over to Kenny, who's going to talk a little bit more about this proposal about potentially changing a requirement from 220 to 180, only taking into account the removal of elective credits, not the core requirements for graduation. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, when I was named pre principal of Orange Grove High School four years ago, one of my main missions was to change it from a school where all the bad kids go to a school of hope and bringing the, the reality, I'm not much of a data person, but trying to look at, at, at the reality of this situation is, is looking at the students that we would potentially have that are graduating in June, um, looking at our data if we reduced the number of elective credits by about 40, that it would allow us at this current point for 21 more students to graduate in the June, uh, June graduation this year. Uh, that doesn't mean any core classes. It goes back to the elective classes. And these are classes that will allow students the hope of being able to graduate from high school, move on to either Norco College or a trade school or another opportunity to help them move on to bigger and better things in their lives. As you know, the kids come to us from Orange Grove with extreme traumatic experiences. For, exa for example, just enrolled with us last week. The kid is 80 credits behind. His brother OD'd four weeks ago. Two weeks later, he ODs, but he shows up to Orange Grove the first day of school because he wants to try and graduate, even though he knows that the mountain that he's looking at is 80 credits. But we, look, we looked at his transcript. He's completed all of his core classes, except only a couple, but most of that is elective credits. And why hold back a kid like that? Because the reality is, with our, with our students that become fifth years, unfortunately, they become dropouts, and that's what we're trying to eliminate. So the example that Mr. Torres provided is about looking at this year's students to say, what difference can we make now with these students 
Another question that we asked, though, was, and would this be a difference that would maintain over time, and would it be true even in the past? So one of the things we did is we took a look at last year's graduating class and kind of asked retroactively, so if we were to have this kind of rule in place last year, would it have made a difference? And what we found was that of the 49 students who finished with us in Corona Norco but did not graduate, 28 of them may have had an opportunity through a program such as this. And just to wrap it up, we want to look at the system as a whole, which is going to take a, a broader uh, and, and a more depth study, which we will do and bring it back in the future. But right now we see an opportunity to make an adjustment with two specific programs when, uh, within alternative education that could certainly have an impact for several at promise students. Thank you. Dr. Simon, thank you, and thank you to your, to your team. Um, beginning with uh, Dr. Bourgeois, looking at the data and using data to really dive deeper, using it as a flashlight to find these bright spots and opportunities um, for us. And again, just to reemphasize, we're talking about for the alternative program at Orange Grove. And one of the tasks that we have is not only fight a good fight with equity and close and narrow the achievement gap, but that begins with an opportunity gap. By doing what we're doing in June of 2020, we will have made, if the board approves in the future, made a real impact for these kids and give them at least a fighting chance of becoming an adult and uh, living a somewhat of a productive life. So again, thank you so much. Appreciate the, um, the, really, the realization of this opportunity. And, uh, we will be uh, consulting with the board and, and asking, seeking any questions you may have tonight or later. And it is with our hope that we can bring this proposal for your uh, adoption at the next board meeting. If you have any questions. Just make a comment. I want to thank you for looking at alternatives for alternative ed students, giving them the opportunity to be successful out there in the real world, because that's what we're looking at, is making an opportunity for these kids to be successful. And I thank you for doing that. And uh, I want to know when would the deadline have to be to make this decision for 2020? I would have to give the exact deadline for you, but we do know that if we act within the next month, this month or so, our students, would, the, our current uh, graduating class 2020 would be affected by it, by that decision. Thank you, so within a month. Thank you, Dr. Simon. Madam President, that concludes my report, thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we will go on to public hearing. The public hearing is now open in connection with the following resolutions. 2019 to 2020, resolution number 73, determining the validity of prior proceedings relative to the formation of CFD 19-1, established CFD 19-1, Authorizing the levy of a special tax within CFD 19-1 and calling an election. And 2019 through 2020, resolution number 74, determining the necessity to incur bonded indebtedness in an amount not to exceed 4 million five hundred within CFD 19-1 and calling an election. The school district has received no written protest from landowners to be included within CFD number 19-1. At this time, I would like to ask if there's any members in the audience who wish to speak with respect to CFD number 19-1. Seeing none, uh, the public hearing is now closed and the Board of Education will consider the resolution pertaining to CFD 19-1 later in the meeting. We will now move on to student board member report. Thank you, Madam President. So Centennial has a new dance this month, the 31st, that is race car themed and will be held at the race car museum. Santiago has Mr. and Mrs. SHS on the 23rd and What If Week starting the 27th. Roosevelt has a winter pep rally on the 27th, ASB Yes Youth Education Series Leadership Training, the 23rd. 
Roosevelt Rush is this Friday and next Friday, and they will be hosting a speaker, Eric Thomas, on the 29th for motivation for students and to get students involved in leadership activities. JFK has a joint winter dance with Norco on the 25th, and they will have a blood drive coming up on Valentine's Day, as well as their annual Glow Fest after school, which will have a DJ, food, and more. Corona has 8th grade day on the 28th and elective brush on the 30th. And they are also prepping for Sadie Hawkins on the 29th of February and the blood drive on February 7th. Norco did not respond, but they are preparing for the dance with JFK as well. And that concludes my report. Board member report, we will start with Dr. Lois. I'm wearing white for lung cancer because my grandma had lung cancer. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming uh, at this board meeting. Uh, in terms of my report, I just like to make a comment on the alternative education. I hope that uh, we're looking at quality of offering that, that students need in terms of either uh, math, language arts, or requirements for them to go to other areas of interest that they might have, might have been. So it's not just lessening the numbers of units from 220 to 180, but then we're pay, paying attention to the quality. You know, we just don't want to keep them out of the system. You know, but making sure that, uh, that they have all the skills necessary. Uh, in terms of my report, uh, February 6th, I've been working with uh, a number of uh, English language arts uh, coordinators in different districts, and we're putting together this uh, symposium on English language learners and equity. Uh, we are raising the question whether English language learning is a language problem, or is it a social emotional problem, or is it a race problem, or is it attitude of the adults on dealing with our English language learners. So, because English language learning is not just a language problem, but it's also a cognitive as well as social emotional. So we will have that conversation on February 6th. On February 24, uh, I'm involved in uh, with Redlands Unified School District and my university and other higher ed uh, institutions putting together this CSTEM uh, conference. And the focus of that is to provide intervention to students who are not meeting standards in terms of mathematics, but beyond just the traditional way of meeting those needs by giving them some traditional program like 180 reading or 180, 180 math, but involving them in robotics and coding and real mathematics kind of computer type of activities. So you're all invited, There's some, especially some of our specialists because they, the University of Davis scientists will be demonstrating how to create those programs as intervention. Okay, uh, the, March 12, uh, Mr. Torres mentioned about hope. Yeah, we're, we're having a, a conference on hope and healing. That when we work with different kinds of kids, we're not just uh, teaching them skills, but making sure that we're raising their hope for success. It's not just, again, it's not just academic skills that we need now to expose our students, but also this notion of hope, being hopeful. And so, that's the end of my report. Thank you. Okay, you can't start this off quite yet. Because I talk about purple, and um, there's a lot of different shades of purple, and um, it's my job <laughs> in the medical field. So, as Dr. Bunrosro, I'm wearing purple for pancreatic cancer. Um, but periwinkle, which is a shade of purple, is for stomach and esophageal cancer. Um, there's a lot of young men in the audience, so don't get embarrassed. I'm going to hit you up. Testicular cancer is orchid. So it is very, very common in young men between 15 and 35. It's the number one cancer. So if you find anything, talk to your parents. Make sure you get to the doctor. Do not be embarrassed about it. You guys understand? All right. You understand? 
Okay. Um, and then lavender is for all cancers, so that's kind of a, a cheat sheet. Um, and then plum is for caregivers, which is vital in uh, helping our cancer patients. So um, I appreciate the, the chance to, to talk about uh, cancer awareness. Um, I'm excited for April. I'm going to, uh, at Kabe, um, up in San Francisco, give a talk on concussions and um, obesity and diabetes in, in youth. So I'm excited to do that again. For the most part, I'm going to bypass my report. Um, but I am, you're not getting out that easy, um, going to give an exhortation, I guess. Um, it's been a difficult couple of days for the district. <sighs> We lost three young men, two from our district, and um, three that were injured. And so we have a lot of people hurting in this, this in our community. Um, we have parents, uh, families, we have friends, classmates, teammates, um, teachers, and staff. Um, I always talk about social emotional. Dr. Lawless brought that up, and I'm going to hit on it again. Um, you know, I know test scores are important. I know graduation rates are important. The number of students taking AP classes are important. Wins and losses, CIF championship, league championship, those are all important. But we're relational. We have to be relational with our students, with our staff, um, our teachers. Uh, we have a lot of people who are dealing with uh, loss, with um, health problems, mental health problems, uh, marital problems. Uh, parental problems, and so we have to remember the relational part of working with our students and staff. So um, don't take that lightly. I, I know we have a, a great district, and we do really well with that, but this week it, it came to our attention. Yeah, so, um, it was MLK Day yesterday, a very important day, and, and there's a quote that I just want to close with. Uh, life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? So just let's love each other. Let's um, be compassionate. You don't know what somebody's going through. And just um, try and just be there for them. That's my goal. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'm wearing teal. Um, when I taught, um, we had two teachers on our campus that uh, suffered uh, ovarian cancer. One was an elderly lady who is now a survivor of 10 years, but at the time she had the option and she removed everything. And the other young lady was only 28 years old when she was diagnosed and of course she wanted a family. And so she chose to save a piece of her body and unfortunately came back and took her within three years. So she didn't get to see her 30th birthday, nor did she have a child, but she blessed our community. So Teal is for very cancer. Very good for I, I want to thank um, for, um, on March 14th, my husband and I are co-sponsoring the Science Olympiad. I kind of mentioned it before. We do have six schools coming from Corona Norco. Uh, we have Clara Barton, which will be our first elementary coming into the uh, into the competition, a JFK, STEM, Santiago, and Centennial. And I hope that we continue to grow. Um, there will be 36 high schools competing against each other from the Inland Empire all the way up from the mountains, um, all the way down into Temecula and across to Palm Springs. So we're a pretty large district, and we have t over 20 uh, 20 middle schools and we have about 25 elementary schools that will compete, be competing in the area. Norco College has stepped up. Norco College is actually writing some of the tests for us for our senior level. And right now we're asking for volunteers. So you don't have to be a scientist to be a volunteer. What a volunteer would do would become a proctor and we would teach you how to run the events. Uh, all The tests would come prepared, like I said, Norco writes them and we have another institution, uh, UCR is also going to help write some of these exams. So this way that uh, we just need people to help run it and grade and it's just a fantastic event. I know Mary came by last year to see, Dr. Lynn came back and he was amazed and hopefully one day we'll come this way as well. So we're looking forward to that. But it is a STEM, it is, it is uh, 
NGSS approved, and this has been going on for a long time. Uh, my husband and I have been involved with it for over 35 years, and so we think it's a really great thing. Uh, a lot of scholarships are being awarded, and in a couple of years, the national one is going to be here in California. So we're looking forward to that. So I'm, I'm asking if, you, if you're interested, please let us know so that um, we can support our children in getting this going. Thank you. I'm wearing pink, um, not just for my wife who had a double mastectomy several years back, but for a lot of women that I know that have gone through it and survived and come through on the other side. Um, so it's important, just as um, uh, Bill Pollock Paul said, uh, you know, you've got to uh, check yourself, and if something's amiss. Don't second guess it. Go to the doctor. So, actually, um, Madam President, if I may, um, I'm going to do it anyway. So. <laughs> um, yeah. So, what am I asking you for? Um, if, if anyone who, yeah, no, that's true. Let's do. Um, anybody, and I'm including students into this. So, so guys over here on the wall, um, if you're listening, um, if you have been, because we're all representing tonight cancer. So, if you or someone you know, a family member, grandma, grandpa, friend, someone you know has been affected by cancer. I'd like everyone to, and I do mean everyone, if you have been affected by it, to please stand now so we can take a look. There's, um, as I anticipated, there's no one in this room seated. <laughs> not, a, not a one. Maybe, maybe the baby and the, but still affected, right? Um, so I just think it's important as we're, we're looking at all the different cancers, and this was Mr. Pollock's idea, and I think it's a, a great idea for us to remember our loved ones, and uh, just and now especially with what we as a district um, have been through losing uh, three, well, two of our students, but three young men that are 16 years old. So I would ask the parents that are in the audience, um, we appreciate you being here. Um, and I would ask that either before you leave tonight or when you get home, that you take that moment to hug your child, because you're here because you love your children, right? Yes? So. Um, tell them, let them know that. Um, you're showing it by being here, which we appreciate and we love, but let them know um, and use those words, love. Um, so take, take that time, take that moment, um, and, and really show it because life um, can be fragile on, on many fronts. So I think we need to take opportunities. We don't know why God puts them before us, but he has, and I think we need to um, to acknowledge and uh, step up. So with that, thank you. That's the end of my report. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, you know, my, I'm, I'm wearing my white because my brother passed away uh, last November of uh, lung cancer. And my mother-in-law, uh, colon cancer, that's why I'm wearing. <coughs> Early, I failed to uh, give Judy and, and perhaps even Norma an opportunity to, and I definitely don't want to leave them out. Um, they certainly did participate in tonight's fight against cancer, too, so, Judy? Yeah, I'm wearing dark blue for colon cancer. I had a family member pass away from that, so it's in her honor. Thank you. Thank you, I'm wearing pink, and uh, who doesn't know a woman who's passed from, who's either battling breast cancer or passed from it, so I'm supporting all, all cancer patients and survivors and those that have passed. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm wearing gray and black um, in honor of a former student that we had here uh, with brain cancer, Victoria Smitherman and any other student that we might have in our district. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Trisha Thompson. Where's Trisha? 
for making us these ribbons today. She just, thank you. Um, this is great. We're honoring both of our students. It has been a very tough weekend, very tough. And um, sometimes people might think, well, you're just a school board, you probably don't even know the students. All 53,000 of the students in this district are our kids. We're like the old lady that lived in the shoe. We really do care about what our students go through. We care about our students when they have accidents. And we've had, we've had a fair share last year, and I'll just start the new year with this. I mean, it, it, it hit us so hard. And um, to keep watching it over and over and over on the news, I mean, I, I don't even want to see it anymore. Um, today, um, I was able to go with John, Dr. Lynn, Judy, and Evita um, to visit the Centennial Campus, where we had 20 counselors there helping. Um, we also went to Santiago Campus. and. Um, <coughs> It was pretty quiet, as you might all know. Um, a lot of students might still be in shock of what happened. And both boys at each high school played football, so they were involved in our schools. So, very hard. Um, Saturday, I attended the dental camp, which is put on by um, a group of doctors. And what they do is they uh, give free treatment to students and parents that do not have insurance. We saw 95 people. We got there at 5.30 in the morning and there was already people in line. People that don't have insurance. Um, many received extractions, fillings, teeth cleaning. Um, it's a very good thing for our community. We don't do it, we just open the doors for this group to come in. Um, in March, we will have a medical camp at Corona High School, and we'll be um, announcing that later. We have 50 doctors that come to that, in, and it's from cardiologists to um, every kind of doctor you can think of. We have free mammograms, pap smears, you name it at that clinic. Uh, last night, um, several of us attended the prayer service for our students at North Point Church. And um, we thank North Point Church for doing this on just really quick, opening their doors. Um, our community came together, together to pray. Doesn't matter what religion you are, they were there to pray united for these families um, of the students that passed and the students that um, are pretty bad, they, they got hurt pretty bad. Uh, that's the end of my report. <clears throat> um, now, uh, CNTA. Good evening, Madam President and board members. We hope the winter break gave you each the time to relax, connect with family and friends, and reflect on this past year. We know this time is so crucial for our members as well, giving them the time for self-care. Um, in this climate of continual change in education, these breaks have become even more important, especially when we have incidents like this. And I really, truly appreciate you mentioning and having counselors on the campuses for the students and the teachers, because when we lose students, like you said, there are kids. Um, as we march into 2020, CNTA has begun to look towards negotiations. We have just completed this year's bargaining survey, and I am proud to say our members are more engaged than ever before. This year's survey had the most responses in nearly a decade. Our negotiations teams look forward to working through the IBB process to really truly co collaborate and create changes that will lead to improved student outcomes because that's really what it boils down to is our students and being there for them and the outcomes that they so much deserve. Thank you for all that you do for our students and for our members and I really wanted to thank you for tonight's presentation and all of your 
heartfelt words for the students that we lost and for all of us who are having to suffer and feel the loss of those students. Thank you. Now we will move on to public comment. No CSE is today. At this point in our agenda, we invite the public to address the board. Please limit remarks to three minutes or less. Comments will be timed. I remind the audience that this is a public session of the board and not a meeting of the public. Although the board will not be responsible, I'm sorry, although the board will not respond to speakers directly, either during public comment or after the meeting, staff members may contact or follow up with written communication. If multiple speakers address the same subject, I may request that the subsequent speakers only add new information. The time limit for a given topic is 20 minutes, regardless of the number of speakers. If a speaker wishes to be heard on more than three topics, the speaker will be allowed up to a total of 10 minutes to address all desired items. Persons who have complaints against employees in the district are encouraged to seek resolution of those complaints by utilizing the district written complaint procedure rather than orally addressing them at a meeting. Please refrain from applauding after each speaker. Public comment is now open. Since we have a lot of cards <clears throat> on um, one topic, and we want to hear all of you, we will give you two minutes each instead of cutting you off at 20 minutes. So we want to hear all of you. So we will start with Amy Caridi. I know you waited a long time. Yeah, I haven't been in front of the school board since the eighth grade. Good evening, I am Amy Critty and I am a third grade teacher at Wilson Elementary School. Tonight I am representing California Teachers Association. Most of us want the same things, safe neighborhoods, healthy families, and good schools for our kids. But for nearly 40 years, wealthy investors and big corporations, for example Chevron and Disneyland, have not been paying their fair share, which has left California with the most overcrowded classrooms in the United States with some of the worst ratios of counselors, librarians, and nurses per student. Our local communities are also facing challenges like affordable housing, first responders, salaries being cut, and the increased costs associated with large numbers of wildfires that have occurred in recent years. One of the biggest factors in California's inequality is due to the passage of Prop 13 in 1979. This proposition capped property taxes at 1% of the property sale price and ensured the property taxes would not increase more than 2% annually until the property is sold. This helped homeowners throughout the state, but the biggest winners were the large commercial property owners. Due to a loophole in Prop 13, multi-million and billion dollar companies avoid paying approximately $12 billion in taxes every year. Money that should be going to our schools and communities, unless these large corporations have sold their property, they are still paying the tax rates from the 1970s. It is time for Californians to close the loopholes to Prop 13 that enables these corporations to not pay their fair share in taxes. The solution that we are working towards is to qualify the California Schools and Communities Funding Act for the November 2020 ballot. Schools and Communities First will reclaim $12 billion every year to ensure that our schools and communities have the resources to educate our children and to provide the services to support our families and our communities. Schools and Communities First protects all homeowners and renters, small businesses, and agricultural land. It will not increase on any residential property. It will not increase taxes on small businesses with a property value less than $3 million, which is 88% of all California businesses. It will help small businesses for, by providing tax incentives and level the playing field by taking away the loophole bigger 
businesses typically use. Thank you, Madam President. My name is Benjamin Williams. I teach physics at Berkeley High School. Tonight, I am representing the Corona Norco Teachers Association and the Political Activist Committee. I would like to continue to speak to you about the Schools and Communities First Initiative that CTA is uh, proposing and uh, with the passage of this initiative, Approximately 40% of the 12 billion will go to California schools, and the remaining 60% will be given to local communities to use for first responders, libraries, parks, affordable housing, health clinics, and to strengthen local economies to lift up all Californians. The funding for schools will be placed in a special education fund to supplement existing school funding guarantees and it will be distributed based on the local control funding formula guidelines to ensure the funding is distributed to school districts with the highest needs. The funding for community services will be collected and distributed to local cities, counties, and special districts based on state law and will be used by communities to fund critical services. The initiative requires annual public reporting of how the funds are distributed so the public can hold their elected officials accountable and ensure funds are being spent where they are needed. One of the arguments you will hear as the election gets closer is that businesses will leave California when the tax rate increases. In fact, Californians, Californians will still have a low property tax rate, 1% of assessed value, which is one of the lowest in the entire nation. So facts are important. California state and local taxes are lower than the national average, lower even than New York, and lower than Texas, and 37th in the nation, according to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and will stay that way when schools and communities first is implemented. Because corporations have been able to avoid paying their fair share of property taxes, individuals and small businesses have paid more in the form of parcel taxes, bond measures, sales taxes, and extra fees for all kinds of services. According to the California Budget and Policy Center, the share of corporate income paid in state taxes has been falling. Corporate net income rose from $24 billion in 1981 to $203 billion in 2015. At the same time, the share of this income paid in state corporation taxes fell from 10% to 4.4%. Nearly every other state in the union regularly assesses commercial property on the fair market value, and the Schools and Communities First initiative will finally bring California into the 21st century. Thank you. Brenda Forrester. Hi, Brenda. Hi, Good evening, Madam President and Board. My name is Brenda Forrester. I am a first grade teacher at Stallings Elementary School and had the pleasure of having Mr. Alex Sund in my class years and years ago. Um, so the three of us are here speaking to you tonight because we've been working with the California Teachers Association and many other supporters throughout the state, including numerous school board members, state, federal, and local elected officials, local governments, labor organizations, and philanthropic organizations as a partial list to collect the signatures needed to ensure that the Schools and Communities First initiative is placed on the November 2020 ballot. We'd like to encourage everyone here tonight in this room to educate themselves about the initiative and take the time to become educated supporters and voters. Schools and Communities First has a website by that name as well as a, a social media presence so the information is out there on the web for you to investigate for yourself. Um, we've provided the board with handouts on Schools and Communities First, and there are also handouts on the back table for people in the room that would like to take them. Um, please don't dismiss this initiative without taking the time to learn about it and how much good it can do for our schools and communities. We're collecting signatures on petitions to ensure that this initiative is on the ballot in November 2020. 
To qualify for the ballot, we need to collect 997,139 valid signatures, which means gathering a total of 1.6 million signatures. If anyone is interested in collecting signatures and helping with this effort, I'd be happy to talk to them after the meeting. I have plenty of petitions in my bag. Um, we've been out in the community working to collect signatures um, just as representatives of our career, how important it is to get the extra funding for our schools. Um, we also have petitions to sign after the meeting and invite you all here to take a few minutes to do that. We have a lot of young people here that hopefully are registered to vote if they're 18 years old. If not, I would encourage them to do that. I truly believe that passing this initiative into law can make a tremendous difference in our children and how our children are educated and how communities are served. I'm not by nature a political activist and this is really the first time I've ever stepped up because the initiative is something that I really believe in and how it can make a difference for all of us. Um, as a teacher, I know firsthand how budget cuts have affected us. Um, Mr. Pollock spoke very eloquently about the relationships that we develop in schools with our children and uh, smaller class sizes allow us to do that, having full-time counselors on campuses allow us to help children with social and emotional needs and those are things that um, we've really had to fight for. We would respectfully ask that the board members consider endorsing this initiative. If you do so, you'll be joining many individuals and organizations throughout the state who are working to ensure that our schools and communities get the funding needed to support our schools and communities. Thank you for letting us speak this evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam President. Good evening, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here tonight. My name is Annette Farrell, and I'm the local group leader of the Inland Empire chapter of Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. Within that group, I am one of the leaders also for Be Smart, which is a non-political educational program developed by Moms Demand Action. Its aim is to inform and empower parents and adults concerned about kids, guns, and safety. It's open to people of all political stripes, genders, professions, gun owners, and non-gun owners alike everyone and anyone ready to make safer communities. I'm here tonight to ask you to begin, to please begin taking action in an effort to reduce gun violence, which is something that we can do here at a school district level to the 53,000 students that you serve. One of the items is the Be Smart program and how it can make our community safer. And the other item is simply to point out that LAUSD has recently done this in the beginning of their school year, September of 2019. Personally, I'm a parent of a senior at Santiago High School. My kids have attended the schools since 2012, and I'm joined tonight as well by two members and supporters, Nicole, Nicole Fisher, a teacher in CNUSD, and James Mankey, a police officer who lives here in Corona and has children as well at Corona schools. I would just like to mention a few staggering statistics, which are hard to hear, but I'm going to list them. We know that in incidents of shootings on school property, 78% of the cases involve shooters under the age of 18. The guns come from their homes or the homes of relatives. We know that nearly 400,000 guns are stolen from homes and vehicles every year. We also know that it's the responsibility of adults to keep guns out of the hands of children. Our Be Smart presentation is one that I or other trained presenters in our group give to any venue, communities, school districts, PTAs, churches, private organizations. It focuses on the principles of safe gun storage, modeling responsible behavior, asking about the presence of firearms, recognizing the roles of gun in suicide, and telling others about the program. One point to underscore, please, is that this is not an anti-gun program. It is anti-gun violence. It's geared towards parents and not students. It's apolitical and immediately actionable. We look forward to the opportunity to work with you and ideally your safety director, Steve Ellis, who I reached out to before, um, and seeing if we can collaborate together. And I would just like to ask Nicole and James to say a word or two. 
Uh, thank you. As, I said, or as Annette introduced me, Nicole Fisher. I am a teacher in the district. Most importantly, I'm a parent too. So I have a daughter who just graduated last year, a son who is a junior at San Diego High School. And I commend the school district what we've done so far, the discussions, the preparations for incidents involving guns on campus, the behind the scenes, the monitoring the social media, working with the police department. My guess, my next question would be is, um, as a teacher, we're lifelong learners. So what's the next step? What can we do as a teacher, as a school district, to help prepare our um, families, educate our families, educate students and families as well? Thanks. Um, your time is up. Thank you very much. Anna Mesa. Good evening, Madam President, School Board Trustees. Um, I'm here tonight as a parent, and I would just like to add to the, um, the state ballot measure. This, this has been a problem that's been going on for a while. Um, I had the opportunity to advocate on behalf of PTA for about eight years, and during that time, I saw this loophole in Prop 13. The legislature tried to close it, but there's so much gridlock in our legislature that they could not, they could not get it out of the legislature. So I give um, our teachers a lot of credit for taking the initiative to, to collect these signatures and to try and get it on the ballot in 2020. Uh, this would be an awesome opportunity for us to reclaim the $12 billion that are lost that, that could be going into our community. And as far as our schools, what that means for our schools, $12 billion, I mean, 42% of that, 42% of that under Prop 98 would come to K-14 to schools. I mean, that, that's not a promise that Sacramento can even break. That's state law. So my point is just parents parents support this. California State PTA has a membership of about 727,000 members now, and California State PTA also supports this state ballot measure. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Kevin Cantrell. Good evening. Good evening. I think we're taking time to hear us out. We're going to hear support for uh, the Cadillac coaches from Eleanor Roosevelt, Presley, uh, Nico, Stephanie, and Mike. Our son Dimitri has only been wrestling for two years yet. But at that time, we've got to know the headlines not only as wrestling coaches, but as human beings as well. Not only are they excellent coaches, but they care deeply for our student athletes and their families. They are also generally good people. They give up their free time to coach our student athletes on weekends and weekdays. They are completely committed to the well-being of the wrestling pro program and their wrestling families. This investigation of the false allegations, which has been proven to be false from the very beginning, had deprived us of two of our coaches for what could be an entire season. The only wrestling left for the regular season is the duel with Cynthia Centennial this Thursday and the championships this Saturday. And for our senior student athletes, there's not a next season. This season was not what it should have been for them. Now we're going to talk about the effect that this has had on our coaches themselves, which is significant. That is for them to address that they so choose. But it has taken something that they have loved for their entire life and tainted it over false allegations. This process, this experience, is not something that they will ever forget. This wrestling program is the only school of sports program that I know of that allows open practices. The Catalines are the only coaches that not only allow open practices, but encourages the parents to attend. On any given night, you can go to the wrestling practices and see parents in attendance. Catalan sports programs have made an appointment to speak to the coaches, but the Catalines are available to the parents all the time. If they abuse a student athlete as a false allegations alleges, why would they have open practices and encourage the parents to attend? As I am a sergeant with the Riverside County Sheriff's Department, I have an obligation to protect society, and if any kind of abuse was witnessed, it would have been stopped and acted upon. If I failed to act, I could be disciplined up to and including termination on my employment. As I previously advised, I saw no such abuse 
<coughs> bullying or intimidation during a Friday, November 22nd practice or during any practice since our son began wrestling in 2018. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'm at your disposal. Thank you. Yes, sir. Miguel Martinez. Good evening. My name is Miguel Martinez. I'm a certified athletic trainer at Eleanor Roosevelt High School. I've been a certified athletic trainer for the past five years. The work I have done serves the largest student athlete population in the southern sector and one of the fastest growing cities in the nation. My job serves the community, providing medical care not solely to the high school, but the community and the 5Ks, the fairs, and even concerts hosted. Under my care, the, the RHS athletics uh, success has grown tenfold, with multiple championships, whether local conference, CIF, or even state titles. And this is the first time I've spoken on this matter. I come before you as a provider, but also as a concerned member of the community. The false allegations brought upon our coaches has impacted my job and has negatively impacted the students in the community in which I serve. I look to you, the board, to help navigate this case more swiftly and more efficiently than what has been served thus far. The Catalan family are guilty of believing in their athletes and the administrators, even when that belief supersedes the potential realized by those individuals. Thank you for your time. Christine Ibarra. Good evening, thanks for listening to us. Um, I'm one of the concerned parents, and like a couple of the other parents in this room, I attend probably 90% of the wrestling practices, along with my husband, who is in law enforcement as well. And he was there that night, and night leading up to that, like we always are, because we love to watch our son wrestle, not only in competitions, but in practice. Um, the frustration on our part is my husband wrote a full report of what he saw, what he witnessed, forwarded it to the district. Not one person has contacted him during this alleged um, investigation of these incidences. So we have been cheated two coaches this season. We have one coach that is running himself ragged and it is putting him in medical distress. I'm an RN. I'm in that room as well. I am also obligated by law to report abuse or I can lose my job as well. I've never seen anybody lay any malicious hands on the children in that room. Yes, it's physical, it's wrestling, but never have I seen them intentionally hurt another wrestler. Not their own kids, not my kids, not anybody else's kids. Um, I just want to bring it to the attention that this investigation is taking way too long. We have come to the end of our season. For some of these kids, they're being cheated scholarships because they haven't had the full coaching staff to help them progress to that next level. We've got CIF coming up. We have one coach. I don't know how that's going to happen. And this is this is frustrating as a parent. I. I I could only imagine what Coach Pico and Coach Stephanie are going through, feeling like they've done something wrong when they've done nothing wrong. And it should be credited to the fact that we're taking the word of people that have a known bad character over good citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you. Marie. Delatore. First and foremost, I would like to thank you all for your time and allowing me to speak today. My name is Dr. Marie Delatore, and both my husband and I have had the privileged opportunity to have our son Sebastian participate as a varsity wrestler under Mike Stephanie and Nico Cataline. This is Sebastian's senior year. Unfortunate injury at the Black Watch Tournament in December prevents him from continuing his senior season. Nevertheless, the past four years have truly been advantageous for us just knowing the coaches. Our coaches are true model, mo role models. Without question, their integrity is what many aim to possess themselves as well as, well as in their peers. I attend most daily practices and all tournaments, schedules both home and away. 
During these times as a mother, I observe, as all mothers do, I watch. I pay attention to the interactions between coaches and students, coaches and parents, as well as coaches and coaches. I have not had the dismay of being present to any ill cor correlations or any negative interactions of any kind. I have, however, been present during the many positive influences that coaches have portrayed and exude towards the members of their team, to include both past and present wrestlers. Our student athletes are resilient because they are wrestlers. Our student athletes are aggressive because they're wrestlers. Our student athletes need their coaches because they are wrestlers. Our student athletes deserve their coaches because they're kids. The pride scattered on the faces of our ERH as wrestling athletes is unchallenged by any local high school, and that is a, is a bona fide credit to all Mike, Stephanie, and Nico Cataline. The passion seen in our, the eyes of our wrestlers is a direct result of ongoing recognition, continued confidence building, and the tireless ambition built by a proactive program to maintain exceptional and motivated wrestlers, wrestling competitors. I have the deepest personal and professional respect for our coaches and sincerely believe their unique energy is what allowed this program to thrive for over a decade. Let's not underprivilege our current or our future wrestlers for that matter by not allowing our coaches to return. Again, I appreciate your time and I look forward to your unbiased consideration of our common goal to find a resolution to the issues caused by malicious fields that have seemed to overcome our wrestling program at Roosevelt. Thank you. Lisa Sines. Good evening, my name is Lisa Sines, and I am going to read a letter from one of my wrestling sons. He's not my biological son, but he is one of my wrestler's sons. Dear President and members of the Board of Trustees, my name is Quentin Hunter, and I am 17 years old at Eleanor Roosevelt High School. I am writing this letter today to you in hopes that you will consider the importance of two volunteer individuals that have not only coached our wrestling team, but have been the most influential people in my life because of everything that they have done for me and those around me, and here is why. One month before the start of my freshman year in high school, my father, a deputy, was involved in a major life-altering crash while on duty. My life changed right before my eyes. My mother, understandably, was focused on raising two little kids and my dad's recovery in and out of the hospital, and I was focused on staying out of the way and preparing myself for my new life. Starting school one month after this life-altering event, I wasn't sure how I was going to do in high school, a high school full of 4,800 students. I wanted to give up before it even started. I struggled with grades, and no one really knew the issues I was facing because they were busy with the recovery. I was scared. I was lost. I felt alone. I literally found myself in a fork in the road, keeping going down the hard path or take the easy way out. After failing another test that I didn't study for, I saw the wrestling team handing out flyers promoting their team. I went to the information meeting and I met Coach Nico Cataline, Mike Cataline, and Coach Mom Cataline. My life forever changed that day and I found my second family. I found my purpose. I wasn't afraid anymore that my father was disabled and didn't have a job. I didn't feel lost, scared, and alone anymore because my mom wasn't around much to help me with things. After that team meeting, I stayed after school every day in the library until 6 p.m. and would do homework until wrestling practice so I could make sure that I was on time because my dad couldn't drive and my mom was working. See, the Catalines taught me that you must work for what you want in this world. You can't expect for it to just be handed to you. The lessons they would preach to us, they actually walk the walk. You must show up on time. You must show up ready. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, this next card I can't read. I think it says Ian Millie. Yeah, it does. All right. Sorry. Uh, hello, my name is Ian Neely. I'm a wrestler for the Catalans Wrestling Team at Roseville. Um, I'd like to thank you for allowing me to speak today, and I'd like to uh, just speak about my coaches and. That's it. Um, I've only been wrestling for their team for two years, but in those two years, I've come to know them as my second family and as parental figures in my life. I mean, we do call her Coach Mom, so I guess that's how it should be. Um, whenever I had a problem, I'd always have her to come to and come to talk to, and the first thing she'd see, or she'd say when she saw me or any of us is, how's your day been? Which it, sometimes when it's not good, that's exactly what I need to hear. I mean, I have a single mother who also has to parent four kids and put a child through college, so 
I don't always have all the time in the world to go and talk to somebody about my problems. And this past year it has been exceedingly difficult to get through some days without having my coach there at the end of the day and know that she'll be there for me to talk to. It's also exceedingly frustrating to know that my coaches have been out, the, out of the room because of alleged allegations from a person who is known to have a questionable character, as, such as posting things on social media with him carrying what appears to be a handgun and using the N-word prolifically throughout his speech. Like, to me personally, that is not something that I believe should be tolerated and to have people take his word over the word of somebody who's been coaching at our school for since its foundation does not seem right and I think that we need to bring my coaches back because me as a wrestler I need them and I can't keep going through seasons like this. Thank you. Good evening. I know you can't answer this, but I just want to make sure that the board received. I think there was over 58 letters submitted that were sent to all of you, so I just want to make sure we receive them. So I will not read another letter for you since you did. I appreciate it. Um, real quick, I've worked in public sector for over 15 years. I've been in front of boards, city council members, everybody. Um, I've also worked in part of investigations and things like that. And I think you guys have gotten the message that this is taking way too long. This investigation is not happening how it should and should be open and shut. The kids are suffering. That's what's suffering at the end of the day. I think everybody's talked about the character of another individual that's involved in this, which is, it's, it's disheartening. Um, you, know, you talked about relationships earlier and how important it is. And I think some of the stories and all those letters, if you read them, you'll see that those are the relationships that you need for these kids to have to be successful in the future. Um, real quick, you have five schools in the high school, I believe, um, that are in your district. Seven are actually ranked in state. I don't know if you guys know that. Seven, seven kids are ranked. Five of those kids come from Roosevelt. Um, Adrian Ledesma is ranked 21st. David Sines is ranked 29th. Isaiah Vasquez is ranked 18th. Thomas Orr is ranked 24th. And Brandon Leone is ranked second in the state right now. They go for their league. Um, I don't ever talk wrestling speech, so I don't ever know say. But league comes up this weekend, which is where they compete against Corona, Santiago, Centennial, and Norco. Top three get to advance and continue. Some seniors here, this will be the end of their season and they don't have their coaches. You know, when Coach Mike, as they said, is the only one coaching them and there's eight matches going on, when those kids lose a match and they're by themselves and there's no one there for whatever this is that's happening, it's just, it's really disappointing. And I ask that staff just do their job. Again, I work in the public sector. I've done this for 15 years. When I know I have something to do, I get it done. And that's what I'm asking you guys expedite this and get this taken care of. Thank you. I am here in full support of Coach Mom and Coach Nico as well as for Coach Mike. For no one can remove the stress, he too is getting it. There is urge every wrestler to do well and become better, to go to college and get a job they will be happy with. The Cadillac coaches have done nothing wrong by giving their generosity, loyalty, devotion, and kindness to the wrestlers as well as to the parents. As there is good and bad in this world, there are those that will try to trust the Cadillac's character traits and reputation, which is unfair to them, the program, and to the students. We all know there is no merit to this accusation and may be waiting for this season to be over. I am requesting for Coach Stephanie and Coach Nico to be returned back to our school, to our wrestling program, and back to our wrestlers as soon as possible. I hope you take the time to actually hear us and the students. As you can see, there are students here that have taken their evening to be here and to be heard. And I hope that you will actually allow these coaches to come back because they themselves are suffering because they know that there are seniors here that will not be returning. My son, my first son wrestled, my second son is here as a senior, wrestling, 
is being stressed with one hand as well as two others. I have my first son who is also going to be resting soon and these coaches are much needed. So I thank you and I hope that you actually do read all the letters that were given to you in each packet so you can see that the parents, there's parents there that I myself am a mandated reporter and um, if we see anything wrong, we would have said something and we're here to actually spy for what is right. Thank you. Thank you. Elisa Hernandez. Hello, and thank you for your time. I'm here today, obviously, because of the wrestling situation. Um, at this point, I don't see any conclusion to the current situation. Um, as a parent of the program, we've reached out several times in hopes that our voices would be heard. We've been addressed on campus, and that only led us to more unanswered questions and disappointment. I have full respect and appreciation for the investigation process. However, I feel that our coaches are being treated unfairly, and that has resulted in our wrestlers being impacted during the wrestling season. Some of these students uh, that are graduating do not get a do-over. This is it for them. Not only has this affected their safety on the map during tournaments, but it has affected their training and their spirits as well as their performance, which results in jeopardizing their chances of obtaining scholarships for their future education. As district employees and board members, I'm sure this is not what you want the result to be. I would also like to share with you my personal opinion of our coaches individually and what they mean to my husband, our children, and myself. I'll begin with Coach Stephanie. We first met Stephanie Cataline, or better known as Coach Mom, when we attended the sports event for incoming freshmen at Roosevelt High School. My son was on his way to the football table when Coach Mom saw him and approached him and asked him, where are you going? He replied, the football table. She asked him his name and said, come back and see me when you're done if you're interested in finding out about wrestling. So he did. Shortly after, we began open communication with Coach Mom with her understanding that our son would be participating in football program. Once it commenced, he would be participating in the wrestling program. Although she doesn't like to share her athletes, as she jokingly always says, Coach Mom, Coach Mike, and Coach, Coach Nico would come to show us how much they support our son during the football season and how much they care by reaching out to congratulate him and his progress as a football player. Thank you for your time. Oh, for me to finish. Oh, thank you. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, we, can't, we can't do that. You can't do that. Okay. Alyssa Moreno. Hi, thank you. Um, I think it's all it's very emotional for me in many ways. And I was going to read this letter, but I can't. And I was the first female wrestler of Roosevelt. I've been there since 2006. I was the first CF champion of Roosevelt, the first female varsity captain of a boys team of your guys' school district, of our school district. I wrestled and I cheered all three years at Roosevelt. Um, and I know it was a huge thing. Um, Coach, mom, who I can't even talk about, literally took me in. She's the mother of eight herself. I was an extremely troubled teenager, extremely. I had nothing. I walked into that wrestling room and she took me in that day. <laughs> if anyone said, did you adopt her? Is she your stepdaughter? She stood at her ground and said, no, this is my daughter. And to this absolute day, my son, that's all he knows is as grandma. They, she calls me every morning to tell me how amazing I am how lucky and blessed she is to have me in her life. But little does she know, I'm the blessed one. I'm so lucky because if it wasn't for her, I literally wouldn't be here. I was a 5150 student. I fought so hard in high school because of her. Nico trained me, which is exactly why I'm as successful in wrestling as I am, and proceeded in college. If I wasn't her, I probably would have trained with Jackie, the oldest, to, to, for the Olympic trials and so much more in life. But truly, I want you guys to just know what type of family they are. As I stand with all these wrestling, they're all prior. 
wrestlers or current wrestlers, but I was there from the very beginning and they've never done anything but support me. I'm a successful single business owner, a single mom, and I do it with stuff behind my back every single day. And I wish you guys could even see the messages, but thank you for hearing me out. But if you can just understand the hurt just coming from the very first wrestler from that program and we're almost 15 years into it, it's unfair. Thank you. Mona Santana. Uh, my name is Ramona Santana, and thank you for hearing us today. And I'm here from supporting my son. Um, I've wanted to support everything he wants to do in this wrestling program. He's new. Um, all these students have been here for a long time, so this is new to us. So I just wanted to let you know that I met the Catalines, um, Coach Nico, Mike, um, Coach Mom, at the Parent Information Night, and it was very clear to us that we were allowed to be in the room and we got to observe, which is new to us, because with other sports for my other son, we weren't allowed to approach the coaches. They were very approachable. So they opened the doors to us and said, anytime you want to come, please do come. So I immediately jumped in there. My son obviously didn't want me there. And I'm there watching. And I'm a nurse. And I want to report anything that I see that's out of line. It is a very rough sport. The kids wrestle very hard. But never have I seen anything malicious, being mean, being cruel to them. It's been nothing but positive. I've seen Coach Mom help a child that was talking about suicide. She approached it, she took it into her hands to took care of it. On two occasions, there was kids out in the hall really acting up and Coach Mom stopped what was going on and she was very shaken when she came in. And her boys wanted to back her up and she says, no, this is an adult problem. I can take care of her myself. I don't want you in trouble. I don't want you to get involved in situations like this. I'll handle it. You guys take care of yourself. This is a family you're to take care of each other out there. So I can never see her doing something wrong to anybody else for any reason. We're here to protect each other, and that's what she's taught these boys. Um, I was in the room on the 22nd when this alleged allegation took place. I don't even know really what the allegations were. I just know I sat there, I watched. It's a normal practice. Nobody was beaten up just besides the boys wrestling, so I don't know where this came from. And I sat there the whole practice and watched it, so I don't believe these accusations are true. So thank you. Thank you. Tina Russell. for hearing us um, today. I am an alumni parent. My son wrestled um, with the Catalines for about five years, um, even before high school. And I was in the room pretty much 90% of the time. I went to all of the tournaments. I went everywhere. I never saw any behavior that was, you know, out of the ordinary. They were always very professional. And um, like everyone has said, they are family. They treat everyone like family. And I, my son now is in college, and he also is part of the Air Force. And he is doing really well. And I 100% I know that being in wrestling with the coaches is one of the reasons why he's there. Because it changed him. It made him a man. And I just... I'm very hurt by these allegations because I just believe that they're they're false. And the fact that some now people are starting to do allegations because if it's too hard, they want to go to a different school so they can wrestle there and maybe get a spot on their team. So they find that all they have to do is make an allegation and somehow they're able to wrestle and do that. And so I hope that you guys will take that into consideration that this might not be the last time that someone makes an allegation because it's, it provides to be fruitful. They get what they want. The, the people that are making the allegations, they don't get any punishment. And I don't want to see that anymore. I want, I want good people to you know, be able to do the job that they're they're meant to do. And these coaches, they are life changers. 
they make people and they make these boys into great men. Thank you. Julian Aguilar. Hi, uh, my name is Joe Nairo, but um, I'm a freshman wrestling for Eleanor Roosevelt. It's my first year. I came in and immediately I gave her my form that, for my physical and immediately she cracked a joke with me and it just felt like a new family. You know, Coach Mom, Coach Mike, Coach Nico, all of them pushed me, you know, to strive for greatness. And they really put toughness into the whole team. And, you know, if it's hard, if it's painful, if it's tough, we all grow with it. We're all a team. And, you know, I can't say anything more than, you know, I love going into the room every day and just wrestling, wrestling hard. And without Coach Nico and without Coach Pong, the, the motivation, we all felt it. It's all gone down. And with all these big tournaments coming up, it's truly a problem. We haven't been getting pushed like we usually get pushed. We need our coaches back. We truly do. It's it's different. You feel the energy gone in the room. Like without Coach Nico, we're not practicing as hard. Coach Mike, he just like doesn't have the ability anymore to you know practice at a full. Like Coach Nico really pushes us for it. Coach Mom, she's she's caring, she's loving, she'll ask you how your day is, she'll care for you. Every time you walk in, if you walk in with that face, she'll ask you, what's wrong? You know what I mean? And, you know, just every day. <coughs> it's a great environment. It's great to be here. It's great to wrestle. And most of all, it's great to be on the team. It's a family, and our spot is valued. We'll fight for it. We need our coaches back. And I truly hope that all of you guys understand this. Thank you. CJ. Hi, I'm CJ Mover. Um, I met Coach Mom when I was uh, 16 years old. 16 years old, 15, 16. Um, I'm now 26. Um, it's kind of hard to say because I'm not sure. Really embarrassed by it, but she found me in a house in a, in a dark place. And she actually really helped me. She being my, she being my mom, and she still calls me to this day. And she helps me work hard, and she helped me want to become who I am today. I want to become a correctional officer, and it just really sucks hearing her cry when she calls me. Because when I met her, I was always crying. And it really sucks because she helps all of us. She helps us with our education. She makes sure, and Coach Mike and Coach Nick make sure that we're inside of the room, make sure we're still not missing practice so we can see and still learn while we work hard on our education. I graduated with a 3.5, and I came into wrestling not knowing anything about wrestling at all. I just had, um, I was just angry all the time because of what's going on at home. And she made sure to know that she was there for me and she still is. She still calls me to this day, being 26 now, 10 years later. And I just really hope you guys make the right decision because she's a very wonderful person. She is my mom. And I always love her. <coughs> Thank you. Sheldon, Sheldon Watson. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, I represent a parent, um, Michael Watson, who is a former wrestler. And um, I just want to say real quick that Coach Baum 
was a positive force. We talked about a lot of negative things uh, in this meeting today, but Coach Force, Coach Mom is a very positive force in moving all of the kids uh, in a positive direction, you know, when they could go in a negative direction. Um, I'm going to finish the, the letter from Quentin Joseph, uh, if I can read that right now. Coach Nico, Coach Mom, taught, taught me what it means to not only earn respect, but give respect to my teachers. To my parents, to strangers, taught me how to keep my head up high. When I would lose to another wrestler, I should, I should have beat. They taught me dignity, hard work, and sacrifice. It didn't matter if you were a senior, four-year varsity wrestler, or or not or excuse me or a snot nosed freshman who had never stepped foot on the mat they treat everyone the same and they do the catlines gave me a second family my wrestling family when my grades were dropping in spring of my sophomore year my mom called coach mom and asked her to speak with me coach mom pulled <coughs> pulled me out of practice and she told me to understand, she taught me to understand what my mom and dad were going through and how much more difficult I make things when I am not the kid, not the kid. They raised me to be, when I'm not the kid, they raised me. <coughs> Coach mom <coughs> told me I was better than, I was better than that and then she was disappointed in me, and she was right. The night I apologized to my mom and raised two fingers to a B, by the end of the semester, she, that's what I'm talking about. Thank you. Juan C. Gonzalez. Hi, my name is Monza, and I got from row C of the incident. The night Coach Mom was just given a lecture to the person. And Coach Mom always gives us a lecture, and we just deal with it. It's part of life, and she's basically our second mother. She didn't hurt the person she was lecturing. She was just lecturing them. And I guess this person just took it the wrong way. Coach Mom is a wonderful and kind woman, and she natures us at our lowest point and would never lay a hand on a child because she loves us. Having only Coach Mike on this team, I had so much stress onto him and concerning the condition he is in right now, it's so sad. Like, we really need our coaches back. And just, it's so sad to see this. Just please give us our coaches back. Thank you. Freddy Garcia. That is the end of public comments. We will now go on to consent items. Are there any items to be pulled from the agenda? I like to pull 9C on page 6, 3 and 4. 9C on page 6. Uh, yes, so it's 9C and then underneath that there's the activities going on. And then 15B. Yes, and then Fourteen, so it's fourteen. Fourteen education services. You have E, then B, then C, and three and four under C. Okay. 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 Okay
High School. Uh, my concern is, uh, my question is, Roosevelt High School is going to a softball tournament in Bullhead City and they only need one adult female supervisor and one adult male supervisor. And the question goes on to four, which we'd have to vote separately, where Santiago High School is going to the same competition but they're taking three adult females and three adult males and it's costing a lot more for the same competition. So my question is why? And then my second concern is, for both of these schools, I want to make sure that when teams go out and represent, that they always are going to be supervised by a certificated teacher. Okay, so you should know that well, I yeah. think I have a comment. Yes, yeah, so we, we did look into that. We do know that um, Santiago High School has a newer coach, and so therefore he's, he's taking a few assistants with him. We haven't stipulated whether you know there's one or two um, um, well, uh, chaperones that attend or supervisors, so we're gonna look into that and come back with more information. The change, um, also the difference in cost, um, one, uh, I think it's three where it shows 600. Um, they have their hotel fees that are going to be covered from fundraisers and donations, whereas in um, Santiago, it's, um, there's more cost involved because it also includes the hotel. Um, I appreciate the concern that you brought forward. We're going to do a little homework and come back with more information and make sure we streamline these things, especially when you have two schools going to the same activity. Thank you. So just to just to clarify on on three with Roosevelt, uh, the estimated cost six hundred dollars for the tournament fee. The, the, are, are are is the team paid for that through fund through fundraisers? Yeah, it's my understanding that when they put this together, they they put the price of the tournament only, whereas Santiago included the hotel fees in this. Right. So entry. both of them are going to be fundraisers through the team to, to, to pay for the new trip? Yes, correct. Is a, do you know if it's a current Santiago coach, the coach from last year? My understanding is a new coach and uh, he's taking some assistance. It's a he? That I'll have to check. I do know it's a newer coach. I can get that to you. So I, I think if it's the same coach, which I think it is, <clears throat> She's certificated, right, but not in our district. She teaches in another district. Yes. And then her father is a co excuse me, is a longtime teacher in the district. So that but maybe that's one of the reasons to have a certificated teacher supervisor. Super right. Does that make sense? This is solve the problem. Right. And the problem is that when we send teams out, we should have somebody that is certificated in our district to take care of our students. And it might be a personal concern, but I just feel that with some of the problems that have happened in the past, this is one way to stop. I agree 100%. And I think this teacher, this, he's an assistant coach, and he is a certificated teacher within our district. Okay. And she, and, but, but she is certificated also, but she's not with, with our district from my understanding. I think we need somebody in our district. Yeah, and we'll still get clarification. And I, from what I understand also, it's the two teams going to the same event, and there's such a discrepancy in the cost. And then I do understand that the other issues, we want to make sure that all of our um, 
teams that go to uh, field, go on field trips, athletic or other kinds of field trips, have certificated personnel from the NUSD. I appreciate that. Thank you. I'll make a motion that we go ahead and allow this to be investigated further and then hopefully we come back with some answers. I move. So we're not approving it? That's what you want. Okay, I have to March 5th to go. Do you want to put it on this? I would like to table it myself. Okay. Mr. Z, thank you. You heard earlier from several um, speakers from the public about, um, you heard the word Prop 13 mentioned. Um, in the 70s, 1970s, um, Proposition 13 was passed in the state of California, which was a property tax initiative. This Prop 13 is a, stems from Assembly Bill 48, which was enacted last year by the state assembly. And when it was put on the ballot to be on the March ballot, it was given the title Proposition 13. So this is not the same, does not deal with the same issue property tax as the original Prop 13. Um, nor is it to be confused with what was referred to earlier by several members of our public as the Schools and Community First Initiative, or also known as the Split Roll Tax Initiative, which will be on the November ballot. So this initiative, Proposition 13, is a state facilities bond. The state has a responsibility to provide funding to public schools for facilities, to maintain and construct facilities, new construction modernization. The way the state has historically done that is by passing bonds and then selling, passing a bond measure and then selling those bonds to provide the revenue, the monies to school, local school districts for their facilities. So that's what this Proposition 13 is. It's a $15 billion state bond initiative for public school facilities, all the money going to K-14 schools, um, $6 billion to higher education, and $9 billion of the 15 to K-12 education does not affect property taxes. This is paid for out of state general fund revenues, um, which are generated through personal income tax, sales use tax, and corporate taxes. So this will not have any effect on local taxpayers. It won't have any effect on taxpayers throughout the state of California, as this is a budget or a cost to the state of California to provide money for facilities for local school districts. And, and what what do we personally here at home, um, what, what would we garner out of this? It's a great question. Um, we currently have a number of projects happening as we speak. We're finishing up our ESTEM campus out at Eleanor Roosevelt High School. We're also in the middle of Norco Intermediate modernization and Jefferson Elementary modernization. We are beginning plans with the issuance of Series C for um, Corona Fundamental Intermediate School and Washington Elementary School. 
Those projects alone, if Prop 13 on the March ballot was to pass, would make us eligible for a little over 30, on a conservative level, over $30 million of matching funds from the state of California. So once we complete a project, for example, STEM, we then submit our paperwork to the Office of Public School Construction. They approve our completed project, and then they give us the matching funds for that project, which equates to about a little less than 50%, 40% of what we spent to build that school. So um, it's significant for us. If it doesn't pass, that's $30 million conservatively that we would not even be able to have access to in the future. So just to clarify, this is for the March ballot and it's different than what was presented earlier, yes. which is November ballot. Yes, the school and community's first initiative will be on the November ballot and that will be a um, property tax that will affect commercial and industrial property. This is a state facilities bond, which is paid for out of the state budget. Taxes are not raised to pay for this, unlike a, a local bond like Measure GG that we passed locally. That's correct. So it's, I know some are calling the one that'll be on the November the split roll. The split roll uh, so, yeah. so it, just, I guess piggybacking off the bill, it is, it is different. Completely different, yes. Okay. Yeah, one, one deals with property taxes of commercial industrial buildings. The other one is a state bond measure to provide funding for school facilities paid for out of state general revenues, state budget revenues. Okay. And by us, so I, I understand this, but I'd like you to kind of uh, reiterate it. What uh, resolution uh, number 76, uh, should we approve it? What does that mean? It just, uh, we're showing our, so the California School Boards Association, CSBA, is the one that asked us to put this resolution on our, our agenda tonight. And it's just showing, showing our support as a district that we support the California School Board Association um, action to get this bond passed on the March ballot. That's all we're saying. We support you in your efforts to try to pass this uh, needed facilities bond for our school districts. I, I, I so move that we pass. Did you have a question? Oh. I so move that we uh, pass resolution uh, number 76. I second. Can, can you send us some information about it? I'm trying to, 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 to Google it from the limited information we have, but I couldn't find it. So can yeah. you send us some? Yeah, I provided uh, Dr. Lin a um, article from a local um, newspaper about uh, Proposition 13, the yeah. um, bond measure, and I can think you he probably will send that out to all of you. And if, if there's something else you need, just let me know. I can find other yeah, information for you. Sure, absolutely. Just let me know. Yeah, actually, I, I would, um, you know, we did vote on it, so yeah, but I would echo that. Um, uh, so folks understand the, that they're, it's, it is confusing um, because it says property yeah. team on it, and then how that works, um, uh, what it means that the state can't uh, pony up as well, so. Yeah. Which so means the, they just don't do it, but I think it'd be nice to have a little uh, cheat sheet, if you will. Yeah, I know the California Association uh, for um, Cash or School Housing um, is supportive of this as well, so I'll have John um, get with the folks at Cash and see if they can provide us some talking points about Proposition 13 so that you not only have the information, but you can share that information as you're out and about in the community. So that's a great idea. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to call for a motion and a second to approve the human resources report. Second. Second. I'm not done yet. Oh. Okay. Then I will ask 
for Mr. Pollock, who is staying as Mrs. Pollock, appears on the report as a candidate for an extra duty assignment at Flintville Elementary. So, you'll stay the rest of the All right. Ready to vote? All right. California-based nonprofit public benefit corporation. I uh, call this meeting in order. Um, it is recommended that the board of directors adopt the minutes of its uh, meeting held on December 17, 2019. Can I get a motion? Please cast your votes via hand. Motion carries five all. Thank you very much. Uh, there's several of these. Uh, it is recommended, uh, number B, it is recommended that the Board of Directors rescind the action taken on December 17, 2019 to adopt the minutes of the meeting held on May 21st, 2019. Can I get a motion and a second? So moved. Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. All right, motion carries five all. Okay, this next one, um, uh, Dr. Lawless, you will need to abstain. All right, uh, uh, letter C, it is recommended the Board of Directors adopt the minutes of the meeting held on May 21st, 2019. Can I get a, a motion and a second? Second. All right, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Dr. Lawless is abstaining. Motion carries for and with one abstention. And this next one, D, Norma, this next one, D, doesn't call for a motion, but it seems like it needs one. Uh, you are rescinding the action that was taken back in December where you were appointed. I know, but does it need a motion? That's what I'm asking. Okay, it doesn't say it there. So that's the way I read it. It likes it, seems like it needs it. Okay, uh, letter D, it is recognized recommended that the Board of Directors rescind action taken on December 17, 2019 to appoint John Zikafus to the, he's a really cool guy, uh, um, to the position of treasurer. <laughs> Can I get a motion in a second? I'm, 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 you're not, you're upstating now. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> all right. Can I see a show of hands? Motion carries my ball. All right. It is, this thing's boring. Uh, it is, uh, letter E, it is recommended that the Board of Directors nominate and elect an officer to serve as treasurer for the term of three years or until, until a successor is duly elected and qualifies whichever comes first. Okay, can I get a motion for someone to serve as treasurer? I nominate Jose Okay, Dr. Laws, can I get a second? All those in favor, please raise your hand. 
the motion carries five all. All right. Uh, that brings us to our closing ceremony. Can I get a motion to close? I'll move. All right. <laughs> I'm going to take that as a second. Amen. <laughs> Let us get out of here. <laughs> motion, motion carries five all. Thank you.